All right. Thanks to everyone joining. We're just going to, we're going to give a few minutes as there's, there's a, a bunch more trickling in. And feel free, this is going to be just very, you know, casual and intimate. And so if you want to, uh, you know, take yourself off of the black screen, if you feel comfortable doing that or unmuting, it's all, it's all going to be, it's all going to be good. And I can see the chat. So if you want to ask questions there, I've got it up and ready. Perfect. I think, like I said, we'll give it a couple minutes and then we'll sort of officially, officially open up. Do you, is it, do you focus on a particular like kind of aspect of radiology? My specialty is women's imaging. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. It, you know, my expert work actually pretty closely mirrors what my clinical work is. Yeah. So. About 60% of the time or up to 80% or so I do breast. Okay. And then the balance of that is uh, pelvic OB abdominal imaging. And oh, I do nice. general as well. I do probably like 80% of my practice as a plastic surgeon is breast reconstruction. So I work closely with the breast radiologists and, and breast surgeons and everything like that, obviously. Yeah, it's a nice aspect to be able to work as a team. And I think everybody helps make each other better and get yeah. better care. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. All right. Well, as, as people kind of continue to join, I think we'll start. So um, for everyone, I'm Jordan Fry. I run the Prudent Plastic Surgeon. And I'm excited to have Gretchen Green here, who's, you know, very graciously offered some of her time with us. And Gretchen, we were just discussing, she's in North Carolina, so a lot better weather than where I am in Buffalo. Um, and, and she's a radiologist, as some of you may have just heard us discussing, but she has really carved out a, a very cool um, niche in, in the field of expert witness work. And through her own experience has done a lot of it. And then in a very cool way, started teaching other physicians how to do it. And so I kind of came across what she was doing and and was interested in learning more kind of selfishly because it's something I am interested in getting into after seeing how successful her and and her mentees have been. So I asked her to to speak with us a little bit about her experience and how expert witness work works and how people can get into it. And then she's also founded the expert witness school. Um, so to talk a little bit about that. So I'll sort of turn over to you, Gretchen, to, to kind of give a little introduction and, and warm up. And then really, everyone, uh, feel free at any point to, to ask questions. I encourage you like to, you know, just ask live or if you feel more comfortable putting it in the chat. However, um, just because this is meant to be really interactive and, and kind of a QA and a and just a way to, to learn more about this, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I've been a private practice radiologist uh, in North Carolina since 2006 when I finished my fellowship. And over that time, I was busy in a private practice, raising a family, and then lo and behold, I got sued. And so how I got into expert witness work originally was actually being a defendant in my own case. And I had a wonderful defense attorney who said, you know, when this is all said and done, you should be an expert witness. And I thought, well, that's crazy, right? Like, why would I ever want to get involved with this ever again? And kind of run into run screaming the other way. But this was one of those times in life where it was truly an opportunity to make lemonade out of lemons. And I did learn a lot through that process. And so a few years later, when I got a call out of the blue to be an expert witness in an OB ultrasound case, I took that opportunity and immediately realized I knew nothing about doing expert witness work. The ultrasound, even though it was a difficult ultrasound case, that was the easy part. And all that told me was, okay, I've got some more learning to do. So I took every course I could find, read every book and uh, started to build a practice in about 2016. Went part-time at that point, focused for almost a year on building my expert witness practice. Fast forward, um, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward to build this as a six-figure business, as a side gig. Uh, changed my life and my options in order to go part-time. And then 2020 came and the pandemic hit. And I saw a need next to connect physicians with attorneys. Attorneys needed experts. 
and physicians were furloughed. They had time on their hands. You know, we had a lot of folks who had lost income or even lost their jobs and were looking for ways to diversify their income. And so then I pivoted and my next step was to offer Expert Witness Startup School, which is a four-week comprehensive how-to course where I can teach you my story, how I learned the nuts and bolts, and how you can get started in just that same amount of time. Yeah, I think that's awesome. So I'll kind of lead off with just some some nuts and bolts questions, because you, I, I mean, that's huge, obviously, to turn this into something that's making six figures a year. That's that's a that's a really great side gig. Um, so how like when you started out or maybe the average person you see starting out, like how often are they getting cases? How long does it take to sort of ramp up? And I imagine make relationships where you become sort of a, a, a go-to type of person for this kind of work. What's, what's sort of like the time frame that you've typically seen? Yes, you and you actually during you know in, in earlier introduction had said the most important part of it that has been my favorite part, which is seeing my students' success in doing this. And it's amazing doing this three to four hours a week at a typical physician hourly rate between 600 up to 900 an hour mm -hmm. from home, even you know while traveling or in flexible time frames, people can earn in that time frame 100,000 in a year. Now, wow. many of students, you know, that those who really dedicate themselves and who really choose to, to take this and run with it, I've seen many students, although, you know, clearly no guarantees and it's a little specialty specific, but it's not uncommon to generate five figure income in the first year, especially if you have a handful of cases at three, $4,000 each. And that's, that's a typical retainer for a case. So, you know, to put that in perspective, the course that I offer pays for itself with your first case. So it's pretty easy math, but in longevity, once you set up good business practices like that, that's just typical, you know, income that people can get and getting your foot in the door then leads to helping you develop a niche and expand even further. Okay. And is it like relatively specialty agnostic or, or like, are there certain specialties that are more in demand or, or is kind of everyone it is sort of everyone useful. Yeah, this is one of the most common questions people ask is, if I'm this specialty, can I be an expert? And it's interesting because all different specialties ask the question. And so that tells me that everybody has that same question yeah. or concern. Yes, as long as you're seeing patients and there are others like you who see patients, there will inevitably be some malpractice risk. And so there will inevitably be cases that arise from that. And sometimes what I hear is it reflects a little bit of some mindset work where internal medicine physicians, family physicians, they will say things like, I'm just an internal med medicine physician. I'm just a family doc. And I'll have to pause them and say, wait, you're not just anything. You have completed college, competitive med school programs, training board certifications in most cases, you know, you're, none of us is just anything. Yeah. And that's the heart of really becoming qualified to be an expert and understanding that when you become qualified to do clinical work, you are qualified essentially to be an expert um, with rare exceptions, you know, little state specific guidelines. But mm -hmm. when you are qualified and you're working as a physician, then you're going to have colleagues who will need experts to review cases um, should they come up and your expertise will be needed in other cases. Okay. And then walk me through, I know this sounds like kind of a silly question. So my only, and it's not even experience in this, but I, in residency, I was working at Bellevue hospital in New York city and some guy like slashed a police officer in his face and he cut a bunch of facial nerves and at Bellevue it's kind of a resident run hospital so I was the one who like took him to the OR and put him back together and then I got deposed and I was at the time I was like what's happening am I getting sued like is this so then I had to go and like talk in court and all this stuff is that like what expert witness work is like or I heard you just earlier mention a lot of people are doing it from home which which even I didn't even necessarily think of so how is it like I'm imagining or is it different? 
it's usually a lot less dramatic than that. Okay. So <laughs> you know, majority of the time you're doing case review, you're either, if you're in my case, you're reading images, you're reading medical records, you're looking at the information that the defendant, or you know, in this case, if you're reading for the, the plaintiff side, that the doctors mm -hmm. had at the time that they made decisions about the case and what to do. Then once you've evaluated that information, you talk with an attorney, give your opinion on what happened in the case and should there have been action done differently one way or the other. And then the attorney makes the decision if they're going to move forward with pursuing the case or keeping your involvement if the case is already ongoing. Okay. And so usually you'll come in at the beginning of cases, but experts can be added at any point at any time that the lawyer feels they need education and information to help them understand a case better or to position it for um, later actions in it. So of the 100, uh, almost 70 cases that I've been retained in, I've done, I believe about 15 depositions and okay. um, one case has gone to trial, but I testified in advance because of the type of trial that it was going to be. Okay. And so the great majority of this work is remote on your own time, doing case review work, and then scheduling phone calls. Depositions, which are the minority of the time that can happen, mm -hmm. are now, almost all of them are done by Zoom. Lawyers kind of fought kicking and screaming, I think, into yeah. technology, but this is one of the unexpected benefits of the pandemic is people got creative. And now people realize it's not perfect. However, it sure beats flying everybody out to a city to yeah, do a deposition 100%. for multiple experts. And then it really benefits physicians who are doing this as well. Although worst case scenario is generally the lawyers will come to you anyway. Okay. So that's not an issue. And fewer than 5% of cases ever go to trial. So just numerically, not a lot of them will, but when they do, you work around it with your schedule. And there are many things that I help teach people to do with their contracts and with their structure of their expert witness practice so that they can mm -hmm. handle this in advance and not get caught by surprise and feel that their life has turned upside down. Gotcha. Do you do plaintiff as well as defense work? Yes, good question. The best way to approach this is an objective review. So basically it just depends who calls me. So plaintiff's attorney, defense attorney may call me. They often um, don't even say what side they're on. Sometimes they do that on purpose, which that's fine. It's part of a blinded review to reduce bias. So um, that's not something that I typically ask because if they don't tell me, then it, it will come out. I'll get the information. But it's very important as an expert to not bias yourself from the beginning and exclude certain cases. That supposes that you're already making a conclusion. So some people will say, I'll only do defense work. Um, but what that doesn't take into account is that there are plenty of cases where a plaintiff's attorney refer will retain me, I will review a case, and I don't find that anyone did anything wrong. That's the end of the case. And people don't realize when they aren't sued, because you would never know, because you never hear about it. So really, excerpts can play an important role at any stage, but our role is educational. It's not retribution. We're not there to influence the legal process. We're there to provide information and to expand our skills and our role as physicians who teach others, just like we do family members, patients, clinical do settings. Do you take cases which are outside of your state? Yes. Most of my cases are outside of my state. So you don't have to have a medical license in the state in which you are retained typically for a case. And a lot of the times they want someone who is reasonably close by, maybe geographically you're in the same region of the country that helps reduce travel costs for trial, for example, even though that's remote. Um, but they often don't want somebody right in their backyard, certainly not from the same institution because then you could have a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. So often during that initial conversation, and this is something that I remember was a real challenge with that initial conversation, feeling like I was muddling my way through it. And now I help teach physicians how to handle this very fluently. Um, they will ask, the attorney will ask you if you've ever worked potentially at a certain institution or a certain area looking for those conflicts of interest. Um, but it's very rarely an issue. 
But that's also why it's nice to have friends, you know, colleagues in the expert witness community, because if it happened that you did know someone at that institution or know the people involved in a lawsuit, then you can hand off the case to potentially to a different expert. So there's lots of ways that we can collaborate as colleagues and also help experts review cases for attorneys. Yeah, I think that that's a great point because I know this was this was right when I was graduating and I still was sort of really early on in discovering my whole like financial journey and that side gigs are out there for doctors. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a physician and I was like, yeah, you know, there's expert witness work and you could do that. And and he was like, you know, no, you don't want to do that. That's like doctors taking down doctors like that's not good. And in my mind, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. But then as I learned more about it, I, and, and this is something I've not done yet, but I came to a completely different mindset, which you kind of just described, um, but where it is, it's like, it's educational. It's, you're not, you're giving a very objective opinion. And there's one of two ways, I imagine, you know a lot more about this than me. So I'm interested to hear what you think, but there's either where actually someone did commit malpractice and a patient got hurt, which is bad. And you want good doctors out there protecting patients um, or the doctor did the right thing. This is a, a frivolous lawsuit or what have you. And you want good doctors there to protect good doctors. And that's what I would want. Like if I get sued, I want a good doctor there to look at it and, and be able to say, no, there's nothing wrong. Um, so I think that's a mindset thing that maybe have you come across that as well with everything you're doing? I have. And if there's always interesting twists to this. And I think the more cases you do, the more you kind of understand how cases are different from each other. You start mm -hmm. to see patterns, but cases are really each each one is unique because of the people involved in the different circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one thing that people might imagine is in a defense case where if you're retained by the defense attorney, and if you do find that the defendant physician did act below the standard of care, sometimes you can still have an effect on the case that can be helpful. Although again, you're you're not going into it trying to help a side one or the mm -hmm. other, but right. a benefit can be that if you can inform the defense attorney about the information, they can often help look at the angles and you can educate them on ways that they may be able to reduce the damages. They may be able to do things in the case that help the uh, defendant physician, even though you may have said at the end of the day that they should have done something differently based on the information and, and knowledge that you have. So people don't, it's just another reason you don't have to avoid on purpose trying to get to a certain conclusion because the information will be used as is helpful. But mm -hmm. we do want to think about who, it's like, who do you want doing your surgery? Right. You know, do you want the, the person who's focused only on the cash, who's only doing this for money, who's, who's operating a mill, or do you want to have many people with a high level of skills and expertise. And that's what we want in the expert community. We want a lot of physicians who understand how this system works, who can offer their skills and expertise from different work environments, from different educational backgrounds. That diversity helps all of us and helps legal cases to get better quality information and better outcomes. We're not going to make this go away. I think mm -hmm. I hear that sometimes. Well, if if doctors would just stop reviewing cases, then they wouldn't have lawyers wouldn't have everybody and malpractice would go away. So that's just false, right? We I mean, think about COVID. You know, when doctors didn't collectively bargain to avoid getting fired or getting their pay cut during COVID, when literally doctors' lives were on the line caring for people. There's no way we're going to have a collective action that's somehow going to make the legal system go away from medical malpractice. It yeah. just isn't going to happen. So we may as well use our skills the best way that we can, network with other experts, help each other to understand how to do this process in the best way to utilize our skills and expertise and communicate best, even if it's a, you know, a different environment. Yeah, that makes sense. And I see Vinay uh, wrote, can you provide some interesting situations? Can you, Vinay, do you mind unmuting and just sort of 
uh, clarifying? Let's see if he comes on. I'm sure I said that and it sounded very, very vague. So yeah, I do need a little context about, I think maybe what I was referring to, ah, uh, gotcha. Interesting oh, tough like, cases. Okay. Ah, uh, got it. Yes, sure. So I think originally I was referring to unexpected situations where even when you're retained by the defense and you find that they did not act uh, as they should, that even that can have a positive, helpful outcome for a case. Um, you know, I will say the tough cases happen when people start behaving badly. And the, the way, <laughs> how do doctors behave badly is finger pointing. So um, the worst, the, what makes me cringe the most is when I'm reviewing a case and the plaintiff, the patient has a statement in a deposition or a complaint that the doctor they saw who made I'll provide a breast cancer diagnosis as an example. The doctor who diagnosed their breast cancer said, I looked at your old mammogram and I can see the cancer was there and they should have had you come back for more mammograms because we could have caught the cancer then. I don't know why they didn't find the cancer before. That is one of the absolute worst things you can do. Um, you know, if someone's concerned about what do expert witnesses do? Do they testify against mm -hmm. doctors? That's far worse, right? Is to say the other person screwed it up before because you can't say that when you're in the future because you aren't the person who originally read that study. You do not have the same facts and understanding as they did at that time. Now you have the future knowledge. So applying this retrospectroscope, as we say, looking back at the past and then judging it like Monday morning quarterbacking, um, it does real harm to patients and doctor patient relationships. And that's one of the things that makes people sue the most is when they've heard that comment because it really sticks. So I think we, we each need to just remember that we're not operating on a day-to-day -day basis in the future and not make those judgments looking backwards at the past for our colleagues, especially. Um, so that's one of the more difficult things. Um, because then people can't unsee, you know, what they've looked back right. at. Yeah. How do you find your initial cases? So, you know, this gets to marketing, doesn't it? And it's interesting because a lot of physicians get started with a call out of the blue where their phone rings and it's a lawyer. And that often is the way you get started. Um, so how does that happen? You know, it's hard to know. People can look at practice websites. Uh, lawyers can ask colleagues. Sometimes they'll talk with a potential expert who knows you and says, hey, my colleague so-and-so might be good for this case. He also does the same work that I do. Uh, so it could be peer-to-peer -peer in that case. And, um, you know, sometimes lawyers will find articles uh, where they've seen that you've published something. So there's lots of different ways to be randomly found but you won't get a lot of cases just waiting for random action. So if you're looking to get into expert witness work to really build your skills, to build the number of cases that you get, generally you have to reach out. And there's lots of ways to reach out. There are uh, websites where you can list as an expert that some lawyers go to. You can email lawyers directly, you can call them. And so then the question becomes, how do you find lawyers? Well, you can look at bar association websites. Almost all uh, lawyers who are in even solo practice firms and certainly large firms have websites. So you can build your own database. You can start with people you know and then build up from there. So the results that you will get building your expert witness business are directly proportional to the effort you put in. And uh, this has been an interesting project that I've just gotten into now that I've had people take my course now um, for you know, several, I've had multiple cohorts of students. Um, just recently, I offered a mailing where students could pay a one-time fee and be featured in an expert mailing that I sent to my database. My database is 10,000 lawyers. 
because I've been building it since 2016. You know, this is the re result of a lot of effort on my part to sure. network and to meet lawyers and to really expand that, uh, to have a lot of the personal touch and networking. So um, within, and this was right after Thanksgiving that I sent that first email where I profiled the biographies of nine experts. And within one week, four out of 10 had a new case. Wow. So that's, this is the most powerful way to get in front of attorneys is direct marketing. How you choose to do it, that's up to you, but you can absolutely DIY it. There are, you know, fabulous resources with virtual assistants, people who can help you build that database and help you do mailings. It's really up to you, but it's a very achievable um, goal to do. Awesome. And I know Vinay had another question. Is it common for patients to fish for such comments, referring back to your interesting case about, you know, oh, I saw it on the mammogram. Um, I have patients ask me, did the previous or other physician make a mistake? I think this is really common. You know, I even get this with patients coming in for second opinions. I'm sure everyone here has the same thing. Yes. And there's an interesting format for this in the expert witness world where sometimes you will be approached directly from a potential plaintiff to be an expert in their case. And those direct um, referrals or retainers generally are good to avoid mm -hmm. because if that person hasn't retained an attorney yet, then you they need to really retain an attorney ideally in order to then retain you. It's you want the relationship to be with the attorney with you being the expert witness, not doing it informally for a person who may or may not file a lawsuit, because I've been approached by potential plaintiffs also who want me to review studies for different reasons. And it's also, so, but your, your situation is a little different. I think you're referring to what, how, how do you handle it mm -hmm. if you think that something did or didn't go wrong before? And I think you, you decide based on your specialty, the usual explanation for that. In mammography, what we'll generally say is, you know, breast cancer develops in normal tissue. Cancer usually looks white, normal tissue looks white. So it's not uncommon that cancer will be more detectable later if it's whiter than the tissue around it. And you can say, why don't have that information that the previous person did because I'm looking at your current films. They didn't mm -hmm. have today. They had the previous study only. They couldn't have known where the cancer would develop later. That's one way to say it. And you'll tailor these kind of responses um, to your own specialty, you know, based on that. But it is good to have a general um, statement that you're ready with to provide to people. And so then the question, what happens if you think it was missed? Like, what if it does look like it's an obvious miss? These cases do come up. And even so, with those cases, there are factors that you may not know that happened before that could have influenced whether or not something was detectable or detected at that time. But again, the common denominator is always you are in the future and the previous exam is in the past. And so you're just not in the same shoes to render an opinion on that to a patient based on that kind of relationship. When you are an expert and you're reviewing cases, you review them from the earliest materials going forward in time. So you're not doing it from, I see the cancer on the current mammogram and I look back to see, was it there before? It's the other way around. So you just don't run into that type of situation because mm -hmm. you want to avoid retrospective bias. Mm -hmm. So um, the easiest answer is, you know, I just can't say, I just wasn't in that person's position at that time. Now we're in a different situation and now we have this information. This is what we have to work with today. We have this diagnosis, we have this information and we have to move forward, but we can't really look back. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's the same in, you know, I'm sure every field and, and thing in particular in mind, you know, I have the same kind of response, you know, this is where we are now and we kind of have to just move forward from that. And we all, every physician has outcomes they wish were different. And so, you know, no one, no one lives in that glass house. Um, 
And then last question I kind of have, and then I want to open it up more to everyone else. Have you ever heard of or had you ever experienced? Because I think there's some concern, you know, for people who are getting into expert witness work. Is there the potential like lawyers on the opposite side of wherever I am could start trying to attack my credentials or, you know, I don't know, go back and say, oh, well, they got to be in uh, chemistry when they were in college. So they don't know what they're talking about. So, you know, that's obviously not it but to go back and say you know well this person's not trustworthy because of this reason or that reason and then all of a sudden you're like you know somehow in the crosshair i i think that could be a concern is that actually a concern we should have is that something that doesn't really come up what have you seen i put this in the skeleton in the closet category and it just depends how that skeleton got in the closet really mm -hmm. People have asked me, some of the more serious cases that I've been asked are, if I've had a DUI, can I be an expert witness? If I've had uh, some sort of a, a criminal record where, you know, fill in the blank, uh, mm. there was a, you know, something that obviously did not prevent them from getting a medical license, right. but still, if someone did searches, it would be revealed now that pretty much everything is just on Google, right? Yeah. Like you don't have to be a super <laughs> genius <laughs> private eye anymore. You Google somebody and this is the stuff that pops up. Mm -hmm. So number one, Google yourself, <laughs> see what's on there because you want to know what is your public image, at least as Google thinks it is according to its algorithm. And can you do expert witness work if you have some of those serious kind of, and I call those like the worst case scenario yeah. ones, it really depends. And you might have a conversation with an attorney just to say, hey, what do you think? How is this going to read if I want to do this work? Get their opinion. And mm -hmm. maybe a good resource could be your uh, medical malpractice insurance company typically has defense attorney contacts, and they may be your best resource to say, hey, I've got a question about this. Can I give them a call and ask? And they'll generally um, be able to do that as a, as a pretty quick call and probably not at a charge to you. Um, the ones that are more common fears would be, I've been sued. Can I be an expert witness in the future? You know, and we're saying like sued for medical malpractice. Yeah. Is that a deal breaker? Well, I'm proof that it's not. And <laughs> it is a process um, to learn how to talk non-defensively, objectively, and quickly about what <laughs> happened in the past and how you deal with that information. So the lawyer is not generally looking for information that will kill your credibility, they're looking to see if they can rattle you. So the common approach to all of this is staying calm and learning how to answer questions calmly, non-defensively, and focus on the case at hand. Um, so other, I'm thinking other things that people get worried about, you know, if uh, people get worried sometimes about credentials, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying, I'm uh, in private practice, I'm not an academics, does that mean that I'm not as much of an expert? And again, the most important thing is what you do clinically. So your mm -hmm. clinical areas of expertise are what, going to, are what will help you establish a reputation as an expert. Um, failing boards, you know, again, as you can tell, like, these are the kind of topics we spend time on in, in our mm -hmm. live Q and A's with the courses yeah. when people ask, well, what about this? And what about that? So I'm throwing out some common examples, but there are as many of these questions as individuals have their own unique situations, but, you know, failing boards, um, you know, well, did you pass on the next attempt? Yes, I did. Okay. No big deal. Just don't let them rattle you and go down the yeah. You know, the yeah, the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. So these are common scenarios, but most of the time, the most common of these scenarios are not problems to be an expert. Okay, that's good. Um, so I'm going to open it up to everyone. I encourage you, like I said, uh, put your questions in the chat or just unmute yourselves. Jenny has a great one now. Um, do we need additional liability insurance in order to cover ourselves as an expert witness? Most of the time, your medical malpractice insurance policy that covers your clinical work does not cover expert witness work. That's not always the case. So the first action is check your medical malpractice coverage just to see. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, do you need insurance? And 
you know, as my wonderful accountant says, it's the cost of doing business. You know, pretty much anything you do, you're if a professional or business um, type of activity, you're probably going to find insurance that will cover it. Mm -hmm. You need it. Depends if you get in trouble, right? And then it's too late. <laughs> so yeah, it's a cost benefit analysis. And um, this does exist. So you can buy, uh, it's a form of errors and omissions type insurance that covers okay. expert witness work. It's a bit of a niche product just because not so many people do it. However, um, there are people in many other fields who do expert witness work, engineering, construction, materials, science, pharmaceuticals. So again, any uh, forensics, um, econom forensic economists. So there are a lot of people who get involved with lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So it's not hard to find this. It is just specific to, to this. So um, you'll never know if you need it till you need it. And uh, it's sure nice to have it just in case you do. In case you do. And that would be like if you get sued as the expert witness or something like that. Yes. So then the question becomes, well, how do you get sued as an expert witness? What can yeah. go wrong? Because as doctors, like, yeah, we kind of know how it goes. Yeah, wrong there's the, yeah. But so for experts, um, there are two major standards that most states will use to decide if evidence is allowed. Mm -hmm. And so there's the Daubert and the Fry standards. And that basically says that an expert witness doesn't get into a case and make up a feeling about knowledge or opinions mm -hmm. and not have it based on actual science. So this came from a Dow Chemical case where uh, someone based an expert opinion on uh, literature that was not applicable. So mm -hmm. the information wasn't valid. So it, it was as though they kind of made up. Made it up their opinion. So yeah. you can't go making things up because you need to support Makes your sense. opinions on <laughs> skills, training and knowledge and, and literature. You know, references are very good to, to support you. So you don't want to be out on that limb by yourself like mm -hmm. you would exactly for clinical work too. Again, sure. there's nothing tricky or different about that uh, aspect of it. So you could be sued uh, just as a procedural issue. Again, anybody can sue you. Will they win is a different story. Mm -hmm. So knock on wood in, you know, again, almost 170 cases to date, I have not been sued. Um, but you just never know that first time. And so having a policy in place that, that covers expert work helps protect you if the other side challenges your opinions. It's a little different if you were in the mergers and acquisitions field where you're doing the um, economic uh, impact and cost of valuing a company. Those are the kinds of cases where you see the experts getting sued if the merger doesn't work because there are millions and billions of dollars at stake. That is not the scale that medical malpractice suits are at. So it is relatively low risk. It is not no risk. And the way you protect yourself is insurance okay. and good practice, right? Number one, just like clinical work, do your best work, support mm -hmm. your opinions, have good practices and a good contract, and then insurance will back you up. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, let's see, Jenny Prater. So I work for Kaiser. There's an internal insurance within the corporation for clinical work, only done under Kaiser. Yeah, that's similar. Like I'm, I'm an employed physician, so similar thing for me with my employer. So I would need outside. Um, and that any, actually raises oh, a question ahead. that sometimes yes. comes up, which is, do I have to ask my employer for permission? And that depends on your contract. So hopefully physicians are having excellent lawyers review their employment contracts and they're not agreeing to clauses that limit their income from outside sources or prohibit things like this, but check your contract. If you did not do that due diligence, and if there is a clause that restricts your ability to earn income from an outside source or other activity restrictions, then you need to start doing some thinking. And so you have options. You could ask for a modification to your contract. You could um, you know, petition for a change. And ultimately, you can think to yourself, where you want your life to go, short, medium, long term, and consider is this something that you need to change in a much bigger way? So, do you stay in the job knowing that if you want to do enough other things in your life that it's too limiting? 
that's a choice that you may face. Um, because generally when people start looking at other opportunities, it kind of opens this door. And, you know, certainly as I found, and as, you know, I know you've probably found with a lot of physician entrepreneurs in the personal finance space, once you get bitten by the bug of doing something new like this, you build new skills, there are many ways that you can find that you want to do things differently that help Absolutely. energize you and help give back to your clinical career. That's, I think, if I want people to keep one thing in mind, it's that the best thing about expert witness work is that it makes you a better doctor, which helps patient care because you're doing it through that mindset of, learning, education, mm -hmm. of being at the forefront of understanding the medicine behind these cases, that's how you get better. And it's so much better to learn from other people's mistakes than make them on your own. Yeah. Yes. That's the way to do it. Yeah. That, that's such a great point. And even with my initial contract, which now I signed three years ago, almost three years ago, but they initially had, you know, no outside work clause. And, and so I had to go to them and kind of say, you know, I, I definitely have side stuff that I'm going to be doing. And I was really nervous at first because I didn't want to like blow the contract over this. But I think for the most part there, and, and I've heard this from talking with other physicians as well, they're mostly concerned, it seems with, obviously they don't want anything that impinges on your ability to fulfill the terms of your contract, which, which is rare with any sort of side gig thing. And, and once it gets to that point, usually people are happy because then they start you know, taking time off like you did. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but they just wanted to make sure, you know, oh, we don't want you to be able to go and practice down the street, you know, on your off time or something like that. And it's like, yeah, so just amend it, say, you know, clinical work specifically with an operating or whatever verbiage you need to use. Um, but I found most places to be pretty receptive from my experience and others. Um, agreed, agreed. And, you know, it's a lot of it is how you approach it. And it's actually a really good litmus test. You know, you can weed out a potential employer that may not mm -hmm. be a good fit for you in the long term. If they're not willing to let you use your free time in the way that you see fit, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it's not as though you're a nephrologist and in your free time, you're going to operate that competing dialysis center across the street, right? right? Yeah. And that's what contracts will help to avoid that type of direct scenario. But if this is a company that will not do that for you and you're not getting to be a partner too, you got to look out for yourself and protect your interests because no mm -hmm. one else will. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, all right. Alana just asked in the chat, how would a lawyer engage you for a case to review? Uh, how do they know you have an interest in this area? And you kind of talked a little bit about it with, with reaching out and, and forming a network, but how, how do they typically kind of engage? Yes, early on, it's a little more random. And so you're you're kind of getting pings from the universe. Then again, a lawyer may have found your uh, practices website. And so they may look at the skills that you list on your profile for your practice. Mm -hmm. um, if you have published papers, they may find you if they do a specific literature search, although that's a fairly specialized case. And when, when you really get into it, if you're going beyond the listing in an expert witness listing site, these are websites that lawyers can search, um, and you would list your areas of expertise there if you were choosing to list. But word of mouth becomes increasingly important as you get more experienced over time. And so your, your growth can become a lot more organic as lawyers come to know you. And uh, I think last I saw statistics, it's around 50-50. 50% of lawyers will use websites to find experts, but 50% of them will not use those websites. And when mm. you ask them why not, they'll say things like, because I think it's wrong for experts to advertise, right? Like it's, it's not just random if they choose one or the other, it's an active right. dislike on some of their parts. Mm. Never mind that the lawyers have their own websites. It's it, it, like, it's not allowed to work that way. <laughs> but um, so later it becomes increasingly important to get repeat uh, cases. So lawyers may retain you in a case later or even in multiple cases, and they will network with, network with their colleagues. And they do it the same way we do. They've got Facebook groups. They've got listservs. They will circulate emails to each other. 
I will have people who, um, you know, I typically email my database about once or twice a year, depending on how busy I am. And I'll send an informational email out with a hot topic and radiology or information. Mm -hmm. You know, once I did it on breast implants and, uh, you know, seromas and uh, late lymphoma complication. Right. And uh, I will get emails back months, years later for people who I never emailed. A colleague forwarded my email to them. And so some, and it's interesting, you should ask. So if a lawyer contacts you, definitely ask them, say, oh, I'm just curious, how did you find my name? And you will get a lot of information that will help you understand that process and how to grow because you'll learn what works and you can concentrate on your efforts on what works. Very cool. Um, so I want, we're, we're sort of approaching the end of our time and I want to respect everyone's time and yours um, for, for being with us. Can you talk a little bit about the Expert Witness Startup School? Absolutely. So this course uh, mirrors the anatomy of a malpractice case. So we start at the beginning module with how do you handle it when a lawyer calls you? We go then through those components of your CV. How do you profile your skills in a CV, which is an expanded calling card for a lawyer? Mm -hmm. Uh, We talk about when you're retained, how do you review a case? How do you organize your materials? What to do, what not to do, what systems can help you and uh, maximize your time and your expertise as you're working through a case? How do you handle deposition and trial? How do you market to increase your business when you're ready to? And I have a bonus module that discusses some of the business aspects that which invariably come up when people start to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I want to get bigger with this, how do I do that? And what are some of the benefits of running a business, whether you you do that as an LLC or without the business structure? Because there are a lot of financial benefits to doing this as a business, and they evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Um, And the beautiful thing is you can grow things stepwise. So I talk about my experience, how I've grown my business to where I now uh, employ my kids to do marketing. They now have Roth IRAs. I have a uh, mega backdoor Roth retirement plan that is specific to my PLLC business. And these are all things I've grown into and I've learned over time. And fortunately, I've had great other physicians um, who have helped, you know, teach me through blogs, you know, and like yours and personal finance teachings that have helped me put these pieces together to keep growing the business from, you know, the business and financial aspect too. So that's the general anatomy of it. Uh, it's eight modules plus the bonus module. Everything is recorded. So you can watch at your own pace. And now new for this session is you get everything all at once. So by popular demand, I've decided to Netflix <laughs> it. And so you can binge and go as fast as you want. You can also do it at a pace that your life mandates you do it at because not everybody has the time to sit there and do each module um, and you have lifetime access. So if you wanna go back later and review it again, it's there for you when you want it. Um, There's some bonus materials that go in there, how to start your own database, pretty simple, um, you know, CV materials. And then we have live Q and A's and that's one hour, four weeks. So you can, and we have a, a dedicated Facebook group also to the course. So you can get questions answered and network with each other. In addition to the expert resource Facebook group for experts that now it's, uh, we're almost a thousand experts. And so people are very active with helping find cases for each other and ask questions. So that's become a really great opportunity for more networking. Very cool. Um, And I think, is there CME also associated with it? Yes, there is. So There is CME uh, 12 hours. So you get the modules plus the live Q and A's. And so it's pretty straightforward to do. And you just click through the links to the CMFI uh, CME links. You answer one or two questions and you do get up to those uh, 12 hours of category one CME. Very cool. Well, remember for that aspect, it's potentially tax deductible or you can also use funds from work. 
Yeah, yeah, that's huge. No, I think that's how I'm I'm gonna do it. Um yeah, well, I, I'll sort of, as we wrap up, if there's any last minute questions, feel free to throw them in. But Gretchen, thanks so much for your time. I think, like I said, I, I learned a ton about this. I'm excited to take the course myself to learn more as this is something I'm, you know, looking to get into. So I appreciate you sharing your expertise and time and, and everything you're doing. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and for all that you're doing to help physicians be financially literate as well. Of course. All right. Thanks, Gretchen. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll send out a, a replay link as well to, to everyone registered. Yeah. Thanks for being here, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night.